the American Theatre Wing, and the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts bring you the American Theatre Wing's Guide to Careers in the Theatre. This session, The Actor. Hello, I'm Ted Chapin with the American Theatre Wing, and today we are talking with Marion Seldes. Seldes. Seldes, got it right. Uh, one of America's premier actors, or actresses, depending on how we want to say it, with a career spanning Broadway, off-Broadway, movies, television, the musical theater. I don't think I've missed a musical that you've been in. And I wanted to start, Marion, by asking you, do you feel that someone is born an actor? What a wonderful question. No, I don't. You're born a person. You're born a human being with every possibility. And I think what makes people choose the theater is extremely significant. I don't think it's to be applauded, and I don't think it's to show off or to be famous or rich. I think it starts long before you know what those things are. It's something that makes you know that the use of yourself, not a musical instrument or a paintbrush or a chisel, that through the use of yourself you can have a more interesting and wonderful life. I really think that's what it is. And you, did you not start life as a dancer? No, I, I, I always wanted to be an actress, but when I was in high school, I f fell in love with the ballet. It's too late when you're in high school. But I studied dancing, uh, uh, ballet first, at the School of American Ballet, and then I came to an acting school, which I'm sure we'll talk about, and Martha Graham was on the faculty. And I feel that every actor should be a dancer, as I feel that every dancer is an actor. And so all those hours at the ballet school and later in studying modern dance have informed everything I do I I as an actress. That's great. Do, do you feel that there was a moment when you were very young where you suddenly liked to stand up in front of people, or did you...? I liked to be on the stage. Uh, I think if I were an athlete, I'd say I love to be in the water or on the ice. I feel, and I think it's the purest feeling about acting, that you are doing it as a sort of a service to the play, to the event. And you are one of many actors. You're part of a team. And that's, in the end, that's the most wonderful thing, when people love it all, what you've done. The music, if you have any, the set, the lights, the other actors, not just you. People think <coughs> it's a great compliment to say, well, you were the best. <laughs> It isn't really a compliment. It's really, you want to be the best at playing that part in that play. Now, how, how much do you think instinct plays into somebody starting out to be an actor? Oh, enormous, enormous. Uh, I think you, you probably wouldn't choose acting if you hadn't seen a play. It's funny, I say a play because I'm in my early 70s. But I think if I were a younger actor talking to you, I would say, seen television or seen a movie. Yeah. But I saw plays f from the time I was very, very young, and I also was in plays, not real plays, but pageants and things. Oh, and the Dalton Christmas pageant, well, the greatest work of theater I ever saw. Well, certainly, <laughs> the Christmas pageant. And it's interesting that we mention that because it's all about religion, and the theater is my religion. <laughs> I thought it was about angels. <laughs> I love well, that. Well, yes. Um, I mean, because I, I, I think that that um, when somebody is starting out, since this is a basically a how-to program, and yes. I think a lot of people who are starting out will will, will want to watch this. Yes. And I keep thinking that those people who get up and do charades, we all of us act at some point. Yes because at some point we stand up in front of people, and it's one of the few things in the theater that we all think we might be able to do. Yes. So when, when is the moment when, when you thought, I should get organized about this? Oh, early, about six. <laughs> oh, early, yeah. And, 
and also when I was young, I mean really young and in, in school, I wasn't pretty, I wasn't a, um, attractive, I wasn't the kind of person that people would say, oh, you should go on the stage or you should be in the movies, which people do to attractive, handsome, pretty people. Interesting point. And I sort of held it in my heart and didn't talk about it. I thought, this is what I'm going to do. I can't remember ever saying to anyone until I was an actress, I'm going to be an actress. A lot of what I feel and I think young people feel about the future is, I don't know yet. Don't keep asking me, what am I going to do? And that having secrets is part of being an actor. We'll talk about that when yeah. we're preparing a part, too. That's interesting. When you, when you then walked out on stage, mm -hmm. did you become somebody else? Absolutely. And I look back at things that I've done as an actress, or actor as it's now called, and I don't know who did it or how I did it. I, I, if, if it were on film, I could look at it and maybe think. But I can look back at things I've done and wonder what it was like, just as we look back on our lives and think, Oh, I was so different then. I was so different. How could have I have loved so and so, or hated this uh, class in school? Or, because you were a different person. We do change every. There's an amount of time goes by, and you're a different person. It's a great thing to know when right. you're interested in acting. You get another chance all the time to be somebody else. Well, certainly in real life, and and you said about about getting up in front of people and feeling, you know. This is interesting. I like to do this. Well, I feel, and I'm an, I'm an observer of life, an observer of everything. I think I'd be that whether I was an actor or not. I, I think that everyone acts. I don't think you can get through life without the ability to pretend that everything's all right or everything isn't all right. I don't think you can get through the tragedies of your life or the great happinesses of your life if you weren't able to make it possible for the other people who are, in a sense, your audience <laughs> to share it with you and to not be embarrassed by it or hurt by it. You, do you, I, I'm talking about the man on the street do, acting. Do you, think, do you think that 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 you're talking about in real life is mm -hmm. easier for an actor to do? No. I think we all do it. Yeah. And I think now that we have television in almost every household, we can see famous people do it, politicians act, uh, people who are on the camera for one minute because they saw an accident. Yeah. That's they know they're on the camera. But, yeah. but, but you who do this as a profession yeah. have a craft. Yes, Let's and so it's entirely different for me. So where, where, where in acting does the craft begin? And as soon as you're able to work with words, with a script, as soon as you stop being a child and inventing the play or being told how to do it by a usually loving teacher. <laughs> so many actors say, oh, my first teacher, my first teacher, and, and mine was wonderful too. But as soon as you are given that holy thing, the script, the scripture, <laughs> then you have to, if you want to do this as a profession, you have to let that be the guide. And the words are the most precious thing you have. And when you get stuck and when you think, I can't do this, you just have to go back to those words. It's not so good to ask someone else how to do it. It's better to work a little harder and reread what you've got, even if it's just a poem you say in school. That's, that would indicate that one of the lessons for an actor is to be your own director? Well, to be so prepared with the words that if the director says, well, your ideas about it are interesting, but could you try this and give you something completely different? There's no point in thinking, oh, it's this, go with it. Mm -hmm. But because you know the words, you're able to. If you're stumbling around, perhaps a better example is music. If you don't know the notes, there's no point in keep playing the wrong notes. The <laughs> composer wrote these notes. I'm rather strict about that. I've been an acting teacher as well. 
and i don't really know how to deal with an actor who is somehow above the words or below the words right. <laughs> um, and perhaps this isn't a popular view with young actors i'm not saying that um, improvisation isn't a marvelous tool for acting to not say the actual words or the actual situation and to try something that frees you but that is improvisation um, and then back to the words back to the words yes and as you work in a long, long career, you, you, the words become more and more holy, H-O-L-Y, right. because you know that the better they are, the better you will be. And if they're complex, the task will be more interesting. And in the theater, which was really what we're talking about, we're not talking about uh, episodic television or even a film which once you've done, you've done, and you must do it in that time, and there is never enough time. We all say in the theater there isn't enough time, but you can go home at night, you've got all those hours when you're not in rehearsal, to rethink it, and whatever your way is, whether you say the lines out loud or do not, whether you reread the script again and again, you can come in fresh every day, work on it, and then, once you've got the audience, which, whether at first it's your father and mother and then your school friends, and the audience is the, uh, the other half of your work. Any advice in, in, to train an actor to understand words? Yes. Read. Everything. Everything. The newspaper. Everything. Um, and, of course, plays. Be informed about the theater before your time. Um, this is research. Subject. Well, that that's another okay. subject. I don't but want to but, jump but the gun. in in reading, really, when you get to be, let's say, I, I don't never know what age you you are ready to read Shakespeare. I played Shakespeare when before I was I was thirteen or fourteen in school, of course, but I. It was as serious to me, as important to me, as it is if you were to give it me a part in Shakespeare now. You could read the Greeks. You have to read every man, that, that early play. Um, you have to know where we come from. And once you do, you will have more confidence, which is another subject we should talk about, confidence. Did it, but did you know at age 13 and 14 what the Shakespearean words meant? Yes. Just and the ones I didn't, just like music, if you keep saying them and saying them, you think, oh, that's it. And then if you get a pocket edition, we're all so fortunate, a, a little book with only that play in it, there are footnotes and all the hard words they tell you. you know, read, read, read the footnotes. That's mm -hmm. and this is perhaps an aside, but I'm thinking mm -hmm. that, that you, you have been part of the premier productions of plays written by some of the great play playwrights. Yes. Uh, any time when the words didn't give you anything to go on and you had to go to Tennessee Williams or Edward Albee and say, I don't get this. I'm too proud. I just keep reading it till I get it. And I certainly will tell you that I look up words from, from uh, Edward in the dictionary before I ask him. Um, he is it unique in this way for me in the parenthesis uh, his um, hints to how to say the words and act the words are invaluable i know that a lot of actors just cross out what the playwright suggests i do not i read everything every playwright suggests and then make up my own mind the stage directions. The stage stuff, directions, right? of course, of course. Um, in <clears throat> in learning the, the words, and mm -hmm. I mean, it, 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 you were also a teacher, and I'm trying to figure yes. out how to get, get around to that. But mm -hmm. when when did you start serious formal training as an actor, actress? Well, I felt I went to an extraordinary school called Dalton, where theater was part of the curriculum. 
And so if you were studying the Greeks, you did a play about the Greeks or a Greek play. Whatever you were doing, uh, you, the, the theater department was involved in it. And at the time I went to the school, in the uh, early 40s, it wasn't a huge school, so there was a lot of attention on every student. That's changed very much. And um, even in private schools, the classes are much bigger. But you were able to uh, find out about the whole background of the play because that's what you were studying in history. So whether I was going to be in the theater or not, I was learning how to be an actor by simply doing the work of the school. From, from, from history, from literature, exactly. and how the play fits and in. and the life of people in, that, in those times. And I came to love research. I came to love going to the library by myself and looking up the playwright and looking up the times and looking at pictures of costumes and so on. And it just makes it more exciting. So you, you took it on as a challenge. You were Absolutely. motivated. I was indeed, by myself and by this holy grail that was in front of me. Do you, do you think an actor who truly wants to devote his or her life to being one must be singularly motivated from an early age? Well, we're talking about something that's hard to put your finger on in the sense that a theater actor today is different from someone who, through good fortune or accident, is suddenly made famous quickly when they're young by the way they look or something. And they're suddenly on TV, and they're suddenly what's now called a star. And that's not enough. Then they've got to be a superstar. Our subject today really isn't that. Our subject is a life in the theater. And I think no one has to say to you, come into the theater. You've got to get there. And nobody can really advise you. It's wonderful to talk to theater people when you're young, but they can't advise you. Each journey is separate, and you've got to take your own. And I think and I hope I'm right, that if the goal is the, the work that makes the play wonderful, then you'll have a great life. If the goal is to be rich and famous, I, I think we're talking to the wrong audience. Have you as a teacher ever, ever been saddled with somebody who was rich and famous and didn't really have any craft? No, because I taught at Juilliard, which is like an academy. And when you're on the staff there, you also do the auditions. And you know pretty well who are the serious uh, young actors and who aren't. I was so fortunate, both in my own training and in the teaching, which I did for almost 22 years, in dealing with, dealing with people who belonged where they were at that moment. And you could, you could tell that in the audition instantly, process. Instantly, instantly. Unless people were frightened, we could talk about confidence now. Right. When you're frightened, you can't do your best work. When you're frightened, you can't be, well, in life, you can't eat your food, you can't, you don't know what to wear, you don't like yourself. Fear is a terrible thing in, in, in the world. And as a young actor, you have to find your own ways to overcome it. Mine, if they're of any help, are these. I try to find something in an audition that's wonderful and want to audition and want to try to get a part, even if I'm not really the right person for it, and to deal with the audition or or let's say the audition for a school, an acting academy or something, to deal with it as sort of an opening night. Do it. See how well you can do it. Want it. Because the alternative is not to audition and for no one to know. Right. Is, is there a difference between fear and nerves? I think they're uh, uh, together. I think it's joined together. And, and as you uh, learn when you study acting, 
you can simply by the process of breathing deeply and simply being quiet and finding your way to go into yourself to prepare. Remember I said there were secrets. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the way actors prepare are quite secret. I mean, some people just bound onto the stage. Some people are quiet for an hour before they go on the stage. Um, I think that is your own way. When I was young and I would go to an audition, I'd get on a bus, I, I, I like public transit, and I'd get on the bus and I'd suddenly remember looking up at other people on the bus and I'd think they're all going to the same audition. <laughs> panic, right. panic. I, I, think, I think it's just more interesting if you always try to find what's positive about the task. Now is that, is that, uh, is that a kind of craft that you were able to teach when you taught at Juilliard? Well, I think I'm really saying it to you in, in a sentence. I think when I was at the school, I tried to give what I've just said to you to the actors through the work. For instance, an actor who's been cast in a play in a part he or she did not want and feels it's demeaning, let's say, because someone else got a better part. I think I know how to make them love the part. Uh, Tyrone Guthrie, an important and brilliant and innovative director, answered Laurence Olivier once when Olivier said to him, what is it, what is it that I can't get this part? And Tyrone Guthrie said, you don't love it. When I heard that little anecdote, I thought, love it. Find a way to love it. Now, now w one of the things that's, in that's intrigued me about, about actors is that, that obviously you take <coughs> part, of, part of what acting is, is to take on the persona of somebody else, yeah, a character. Yes. Um, and if you're playing a disreputable character, yeah. taking what Tyrone Guthrie said, you have to love it. Yeah. Is there a danger of, of loving the wrong person or not being able to divorce yourself as the human being from the character. Oh, uh, I meant love the experience of acting the part. I see. Uh, uh, see Take why the, the playwright needed this character. Know that for the moments you are there, it's essential, important, wonderful. And don't spend any of the rehearsal time wishing you were doing something else. Yeah. That's all I mean. Mm -hmm. And also, let's talk about rehearsal. And even in school, even in high school, if you stay focused in a rehearsal, and if it's a group of people who really are doing whatever it is, a Christmas pageant or a play or something you've invented, if if you really want it to, uh, to, to be worth being seen by an audience, the whole experience can be exciting. And I promise you that when it's over, the group of young people will be closer together as people, as friends, as colleagues, as students than they've ever been before. That the theater has, has some kind of strength of of making you belong to a group and appreciating other people's faults and skills. Now, I, in a way, though, doesn't that, don't you have to have a very, very strong character because you're asked to do this every time you do a different play? It's a gr different group of people, a different yes, journey, and then you, it goes but away. But that's life, you see, and, and the fact that, that there is another play is it fits in just what I'm saying about if in that play you felt you didn't do your best or didn't get the character, or let's be honest, that the people in the scene with you didn't, didn't give connect you. with you. Okay, there's another play. If right. you've decided that this is your life, then everything changes. If you just want to be an actor for a little while, then most of what I'm saying will sound sort of as if it's doesn't apply to you. But when you see it or dream of it ahead of you, and now looking back, 
I can look at times when I felt I'm not getting there. Stupid way to put it, but mm -hmm. I haven't accomplished what I wanted to accomplish. And there's sort of a great dip in your life, in your, in your what by then is your professional life. Well, you need there's to more to it. You need the resolve to, you, to, you, to get you through. You've got to know that it's going to, there's going to be more. And you can't go to anyone else. I, 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 I really think when you're in rehearsal and working on a play, you're with other people. When you are an actor and you're on your own and not necessarily acting, you have to find a way to live through that part of your life that's wonderful. Now, you, would, you mentioned that you taught at the Juilliard School for I several did. years. The, the Juilliard is certainly one of this country's finest institutions um, for not only acting, but, uh, but everything, let's, music, everything. Yes. everything. Um, let's talk about that. Is mm. it necessary for an actor to have training, if not Juilliard likes? Mm -hmm. in some mm -hmm. way? Is it necessary? Well, if we were in utopia and there were lots of opportunities for particularly for young actors who are not trained, who could in a sense apprentice themselves. Uh, um, that word used to be used a lot when I was young. I was an apprentice at a summer theater, or I apprenticed myself to this. I think now they call them gophers, people who go for coffee. But anyway. Well, well. <laughs> <laughs> having been a gopher and not an apprentice, I, I, I see your point, though. But if you, can, if you could work consistently, then you wouldn't need any training, because if you were clever, you'd watch the people you admire. And you would also, to be honest, watch the people that you didn't think were good, and you'd make up your mind about a lot of you things. Learn from them. Exactly. But I think in the training of your body and of speech and voice and history of the theater and so on, I think it's a marvelous and lucky thing to go to a school or to go to a wonderful class. Juilliard is like an academy. That's four years. That's a lot when you're young to say, I give, I give four years more to becoming an actor. There are, well, I went to the Neighborhood Playhouse, which is a two-year course. A lot of people go and take classes, but it's hard to arrange to take classes in dance and speech and voice, and a school at least provides it all. I think an actor has to be heard. We, we have a microphone this afternoon. I think you have to be able to project your voice. I think you have to know how to move in period costumes. I, I think that you have to know something about makeup and hair. and uh, Those things, if you're in a school, you can learn, and it's very valuable. I put in my biography that I was in the, on the acting faculty of the drama division of the Juilliard School. I do not call myself an acting teacher because I don't know how to teach anyone to act. I know how, if you come to me in a class or even alone, how to help you use your talent to bring it out, to make it stronger, to give you confidence in yourself and the material. That, that, that is an extraordinarily valuable thing if you can conquer. Did you, uh, w w were there students when you were teaching who you were unable to, to conquer and you left a little lingering the odd sadness? Thing, no, the odd thing was that the least confident were the most thrilling to teach because I told you how many years you have. Not that I taught every year. Right. I taught the second year mostly and the first. But the growth of the least confident to a confident actor was more thrilling than someone who, who had it. You know. The only people, the only young actors that I felt I didn't contribute that much to were ones who were so good, they didn't need me. But did you also learn from them oh. by your pupils you'll be taught? Oh, it is. It's a cliche because it's true. It gave me a vocabulary 
to talk about acting. When I was young and before, well, I think even through going to acting school, I felt extremely shy about talking about acting. I thought it would make it, it would diminish the mystery and the mm -hmm. beauty of it. And I think it's interesting. I've had the good fortune, as the students who are listening to this will, of being around extraordinary actors. Well, they don't talk about acting very much. <laughs> and here's the trick. They do it. They just do it. They spend the time in rehearsal rehearsing. Rehearsing the play they've come to do. Right. Not talking about no. it. No. Now, you mentioned earlier auditions. Mm -hmm. um, you've been at this game for a few years. Do mm -hmm. you still audition? Yes. Is that it, how actors get jobs? Well, unless you want to always play the same kind of part, you see, that they think, oh, well, she does this. And I want to do everything. And also, you can't be sure that everyone that you care about in the theater world who both produces and directs and so on has seen everything you've done. If you're in a failure, they haven't gotten over to see you yet. And if you're in a success, maybe they're seeing things that they think are going to close. I just think that the young man sitting there taking your name in five years may be the most important director in the American theater. You don't know that. That's what I meant about liking to do it. I look at them all and I think, well, this is something I can do. Look at it. How did you get your first auditions? Well, I was lucky. I've been lucky all my life. And I think, I like to call it good fortune, because mm -hmm. luck sounds a little... Right. I think we all have to be lucky. You have to be there at the right time. Uh, Catherine Cornell, who was a, a kind of inspiration uh, to me when I was a young actress. We were all called actresses then, the women and actors. Um, she uh, quoted just these few words of Shakespeare's, the readiness is all. Now, if you don't know a speech from a Shakespeare play, or if you haven't got a song you can sing, or a poem you can recite, or if you aren't open enough to do an improvisation at an audition, then you're not ready, and you probably won't get it. It's up to you. You might not get it, because you're not right for the part, but that young man who sat there and took your name may remember you later. You may get another part from it. That, I don't know. That's such a wonderfully long-term way to think about yeah. it. Each, each audition is part of a whole long of process. Of your life in the theater. Do you need an uh, agent to get an audition in this day and age? I think you do, but I had a sly way. When I was young, there was a column in the New York Times called News of the Rialto. I remember it. And the man who wrote it was Sam Zolito, and he was a marvelous theater reporter. And he would write just a paragraph or two about the upcoming plays. Now there's a, a publication called Backstage, and there are a few others, and the, the, you can get them at uh, the drama bookshop, or you'll find out where to get them. Right. I think you can get them in newsstands, really in the theater district anyway. And they list what's coming. What's and they happening. list what's coming. And because I was fearful that I know how to do it, I wrote. The minute I saw something I thought I could do, I wrote a letter. When I saw that Judith Anderson was going to do the Robinson Jeffers version of Medea, I wrote a letter to the producer of it. And I got an audition. And I got into it. And I, I was a part with no lines, of course. But you were determined. I was determined. And uh, the other play I wanted, it, two plays were done that year that I wanted. And you'll see that I thought of myself as a classical actress. And I would do all the classics, the Greeks, Ibsen, Shakespeare, Shaw, Chekhov. I've done very few of them, but I still behave as if I'm a classical actress. <laughs> But, but you're also funny. <laughs> oh, yes, I'm, I'm funny. But it took me a long time to... To people, allow yourself to be funny? Well, for people to think I could be funny. Right. And, and comedy, of course, is so liberating, so wonderful to do.
But finding a good comedy is even harder than finding a wonderful uh, play. But um, now, have, uh, have you made? You've made a living as an actor. Always. I've never had to do anything else but act to make a living. And do you feel that was because you were singularly focused? Or is this good fortune kicking in as well? No, that's focus. And that's, uh, I, I hope I haven't been talking too much in a kind of a romantic way about the theater. You've got to make a living. You've been romantic and, and practical at the same I time, which so. is the best. Well, I hope so, because if you have responsibilities, if you marry when you're young and have young children, and you are the man in the family, the actor, you have to make a living. Uh, and I think you sometimes have to do parts that you would not really choose. But it's much better to be in action than to be sitting on the sidelines. And I think you have to think of your life, or I think it's a good thing to think of your life, in, in practical terms, not to want hugely expensive things, from, from shoes to a house in the country. I don't want those things. I want to have a place to live and eat and educate my child and be as generous as it's possible to be, but I'm not greedy about money. Have you enjoyed your forays into the world of television and film? Yes, I have, but I haven't succeeded in them. I think is it a completely different way of thinking about it? You, you had said er earlier that, that, and I think it's right, okay. that one can be a success in that world without necessarily having a great deal of craft. Yes, and then you gain that craft. And I think I have it now more than I used to. Um, the, back to the words, the, the parts that I've played are not memorable. In and film. In, in film, film and television. television. It, with rare exceptions. And only this year have I figured out why that part of the acting world seems distant to me. And I, this is the answer I thought of, and I believe it. The director and the writer, in almost every case, for me, has not loved the part I'm playing. They want it done. They want it done skillfully, quickly, efficiently, without error, and goodbye. And I've learned to do it. So, so, and th they were not interested in engaging in a dialogue about it. No, or taking time with it, or making it better than it was. And that's all right. I understand that. I suppose if I ever got a marvelous part with a marvelous director. He'd work with me, and, and it would be interesting. But we're talking about craft, and I think I use what craft I have more fully and more in more focus outside of the theater than I do in the theater. Because now I've been in the theater over 55 years, and my craft is there. It's on me like this right. sweater. And I, it's so exciting. I, I think I can do almost anything. I think you can. I, I've, I have a, a, I mean, a, a question. I want you to uh, want a confession. How many brilliant directors have you worked with oh, in your a career? Lot. I've been awfully lucky in the theater. Um, uh, I, I'll say their names, although most of them you might not know about. But when you read all these plays that I know you're going to read, if I have any pride at all, it's when you open the Samuel French or the Dam Dramatist Play Service version of play I've been in, you, my name is there. <laughs> and I just, I mean, the first time that happens for you, you, you go crazy because you've been in the habit of reading other people's names. Right. Um, but good, good directors, because I always have this feeling that one of the mm, things an actor has mm, to learn is to mm. protect him or herself from bad directors. Well, here's the thing. If you have a good director with an idea of the play, and you know the minute you go into the rehearsal, you probably know if you've had to audition from the audition. It's going to be a journey with that person. And if it's a living playwright, that playwright. 
I was going to say I, I started out with um, John Gilgood, Guthrie McClintock, Herman Shumlin, Alfred Lunt, uh, I'm going to skip a little, Robert Moore, uh, John Dexter, and, and then the directors became, as I got older, I'm not sure. Anyway, on, I was going to say on Broadway, it's like an old phrase, isn't right. it? <laughs> but in New York, because I've done a lot right. of off-Broadway, I've had wonderful luck with directors. If I'm going to say, because I'm going back now when I'm the same age as the people we're talking to, I don't think it's a good idea to spend too much time judging everybody else, including the director. Go with it. Go with it. Find what do you want to do in your part. Work with the director. Work with the other actors. There'll be other chances with other people. You'll know right away if you're on the same line as the director. And if you're not, find a way to be. Otherwise, you either will be let go or you will not have a successful journey. Right. And then the other director, the other partner, the other part of your life in the theater is the audience. And there are times in rehearsal, even with the most wonderful directors, where it all seems impossible. What are we doing here? Why did we do this? Yeah. And then the audience comes. And they tell you. And they tell you. And they, they tell the director, too. The director isn't a god. The director is another human being like you. I, of course, had these mad crushes on these directors. I mean, I just, and if you look at a script of mine, I don't have wonderful, interesting things next to the part I play. I have on the blank page, on the other side of the printed page, everything the director said, or everything interesting that happened in rehearsal. Wow, that's... That's why I was able to write a book about a life in the theater. Because, really, it isn't my life it's what that's interesting. It's what is done. It's the collaboration. The collaboration. Now, have you gotten involved in the business of actors? I know there's Actors' mm -hmm. Equity, which, mm -hmm. which sets pay scales and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. have, you gotten, have you been involved in that? No, and my brother thinks that it's a terrible thing. I mean, I think if I were, would go out to try to be the president of equity, he would think I'd had a real career. I'm... Why, and why is that? I don't know. When I was in school, I wanted to be the president of everything. I think it's because I'm not very good at meetings. I hate sitting in a meeting. But I think our union is extremely important and, and a terrific union. And because we're all such individualists in the theater, it must be a very difficult union to run. Right. But, the, but Actors' Equity and the Dramatists' Guild are two, uh, they're different. One is a guild and one is a union. They're looking out for the playwright right. and looking out for those of us who work in the theater. They help us get the minimum wage lifted. When I tell you that I think I got $40 in that first play for rehearsal in Medea, and I think it's I think you get almost a thousand dollars in a Broadway play. As and it, as it in rehearsal. In or rehearsal, it? I think, and in um, that thousand is about the highest you can possibly get while you're playing off Broadway. There are, of course, different levels, but I'm so glad I said earlier that it can't be the money you're going after. But do you, do you do you feel that the union the the rates that are set by Actors' Equity, are they intended to be the minimum so mm -hmm. that people will negotiate up from that, or they tend to, uh, is it designed to be what is acceptable to be well, paid? Well, the, 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 the minimum everyone gets is in rehearsal. I remember, I shouldn't have, but I, I happened to look over at one of the stars' checks in the rehearsal of Medea, and she had the same as me. I thought, oh. In rehearsal, this yes, is. Yes, but of course I didn't figure that out. <laughs> I thought, wow. <laughs> Favored nations is a word I love. I love it when everyone will agree on a salary and take it, but the same salary and take it. I that goes back to, to your comment about you, you don't want someone to say you were the you were the best. No, you want everybody no, to be and equal. you're worth more. 
Um, but so Broadway minimum is a, is over a thousand these days. I think it's around a thousand. I wish I knew that. And the, often. I'm. But it's the it's the highest level of live stage. That's right. Broadway. That you can, that that you can get. I. I'm not good at numbers, and I wasn't good at math at school. And my fear is I'll get a part that has a lot of numbers in it, and I won't be able to play it. <laughs> I mean, I'm not dyslexic, right. but I really, it's a, you'd be surprised how often I misdial the telephone. But what, 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 is, what do you feel an actor that works mm. basically all the time makes yeah. per year now? I mean... Not enough, no. because per year rarely means a full year of work. I've been in two long runs, very interesting and unique experiences. Most actors, if they have one, are lucky. I was in Equus for three years, Equus by Peter Schaffer, and I was in a play called Death Trap by Ira Levin. And for eight years, I worked in the theater. It's amazing. That is amazing. And when the eighth year was over, and the second play closed, and I walked down Broadway to go to a play, and I wasn't in a play. I mean, instead of feeling grateful, I thought, God, what am I going to do? <laughs> because it spoiled me. The, the, how, the, how, did you, how did you keep those performances fresh? I keep hearing about the actors. The audience, the audience. The audience has never seen it. The audience has never seen it. And part of wanting to be a theater actor is wanting to do it again and seeing if you can do it fresh. And 99% of the time, if you're in a long run, it means the material is terrific. I don't think you'd want to stay if it was a fluke long run and it was nonsense, you don't want to stay. It's Equus. interesting. I, I mm. heard John. Mm. Uh, I heard uh, mm. Trevor Nunn say before a run through the yes. other day. Yes. It's, I've never heard the story before. Tell me the story. Exactly. Perfect. Well, now we're talking about a real director. Yeah. Tell me the story. And uh, William Gillette, a great actor in the 1800s, called that the illusion of the first time. I can't tell you how many times I think of that. It is an illusion. Of course, you've done it many times. But it's like telling a secret out of school. Sometimes you've played a part for months and you suddenly really hear what the other actor said. I can't explain that. And you think, oh. And your voice going back, you don't have the control of it. It's new, <sighs> wonderful. But did, do you find, I mean, I assume that in some of those long runs you played opposite. Actually, in Equus you changed parts, did you not? In Equus I changed parts, and in a lot of plays I've been in I've changed parts. And in uh, Death Trap, I think I had five or six different leading men. Uh, in fact, in both plays I was in, everybody else went away and I stayed. <laughs> I, I think partly because all the time I was, the, all those eight years, I was also teaching at Juilliard. So I had a wonderful thing to do in the daytime and the play at night. I mean, it was like being in heaven, in heaven. And also when you, it's funny, when you're in school and you're in a play and you only do it once or twice or three times and it's over, to be in a play for a long time and to be paid at the end of the <laughs> week is, is so amazing. But. Uh, but did, did you ever have to pull the other actors through? No. I mean, were, were they all of it? Uh, they were obviously they all different. They all changed, and I stayed, and but I did, loved it. Did your performance remain, or did it change? It did because in both cases we had meticulous directors: uh, Robert Moore, who directed uh, *Death Trap*, and John Dexter, who directed uh, *Equus*. Where w they would come back and look, and they wanted. A result. Have we got time to talk about results? Sure. And, okay. And also, the, so, so many other deeply, deeply meaningful people in that theater that you come to night after night. The stage manager is responsible that you give the performance that you rehearsed. And equity, our union, has that in its bylaws. Give the performance you rehearsed. Not by rote. Right. But you can inform it with new life every time, but 
we don't, we're not interested in your new ideas about the play. And that, that leads us to, to results? You were, you... Well, I was going to say about acting that there's an enormous difference between the process and the result. And to jump too quickly to the result, the way one must, let's say, in an audition, the play and say, oh, I know how to play that. And maybe you do, but don't jump to that. You could be, you could find a million other ways or ways to get to that result. And the most thrilling part of being an actor or actress is what that road is and how to get there, the process. And that f comes back a little bit to school, that if you, if you have time in school, in acting school or professional school, it's a good way to learn to do that, not to jump to the result. And in some ways that plays into everything we've been talking about yes. because you need the confidence to let go. Yes, the confidence to let go, the confidence to be utterly ludicrous, <laughs> to go so far in whatever it is. And once you've done that, it's it's part of what you've been doing and you use what's good from it and you throw away what isn't. But if you are with a, an unimaginative director, you can't do that. You can't do it. He'll fire you. He'll say, God, what is that? What did you do? And you can't say, I'm hunting, I'm looking, I'm going all the way so I can pull back. Have you ever been fired? No. No. And when people are, it devastates me, because especially having been a teacher, I think, why didn't you take that person aside and deal with this? It's your mistake. You hired them. But deal maybe, with it. Maybe they grabbed the result they saw at the audition exactly. and didn't understand no, that there was to get there. I think, I haven't been fired, but of course I've not gotten a great many parts I've gone after. And I think I know the good side of either getting fired or not getting a part, a sense of, I didn't belong there. Okay, I didn't belong there. That's such a wonderful big picture view of it. Mm -hmm. what, do you have any, I mean, we've been talking about this for yes. the last hour, but any specific advice for a beginning actor? Well, to think of it as part of your life to know that everything that happens in your life feeds you, makes you this thing you use as an actor more interesting, more alive, more human, more unique. Martha Graham said the unique must be fulfilled. Well, if you're willing to be odd, and I'm certainly odd, then, and to fit your oddness into something and make it no longer odd, but part of a group of maybe eccentric. I don't think actors are ordinary people, you see. I revere them. To, to work together, to put, to, to put all those ingredients. I'm doing this as if I'm cooking. Right. Well, put them in and don't be afraid to cook it slowly. You can't rush it. Give it the time it takes and bring whatever is unique with you into it, a little flavoring, a little something odd, and then give it, let it, give it as a gift, a meal, well, a performance, a play, is such a healthy thing. In this terrible time after the World Trade Center tragedy, theater is a blessing for people. Do you, do you feel there's any danger that could be done to a young actor by, by learning one method or another? No, I don't, because let us say you have a, a teacher who just says, pick up the cup of coffee on that line and take a sip and then put it down, but put it down where he can reach it, okay? You have another director who says to you, you are so longing to pick up that coffee cup. You need that sip of coffee. 
It's like an elixir. And after you've taken it, maybe you put it a little further away because you've had it. You know. Okay, that's a, right. One director can say, do it this way, do it that way. And another can say, use your imagination. And you, so you as an actor must be opened to both. And when you go home after the director said, just put it there or walk there and sit down there, fill it up yourself. Find out. It's the same thing. It's the same coffee cup. It's the same amount of space. It's on the same line. But you have to make it your own, the character's own. And uh, funny, I think props are so important too. We talked about the stage manager, the prop master. Being responsible for your own prop. Being sure it's on the prop table. There's no point in saying he didn't put it there. You've right. got to get it. Love your prop. Love it. Love that coffee cup. It's different from every other coffee cup. Love your clothing. Take care of it. Is it her clothing? You know, make it hers and so on. Have you ever have been in a situation, though, where you loved and it almost became a character that you found at the end of the day when you went back, when you went back to the dressing room to take her clothes off and put Marion's clothes back on. There was a problem, or could you always? I can never sleep? remember what I wore to the theater. I think where, what have I got on? Because I love costumes. I love them. I just adore them, and they do help you so. And it's ironic that in the theater they're always at the last minute, so I'm imagining what I'm wearing all the time. And I don't rehearse in blue jeans if the character is a beautiful lady in a long skirt. Those things you can take care of, too. And then if she wears rings, I'll wear the rings to rehearsal. That's what you can do. And if she has her hair up, I'll put my hair up. Those but things. it's all part of research. But when you go you home at night, it, yeah. you can leave her at the theater. Absolutely. And you can, you can, you know. Oh, absolutely. Well, I think I would love to go on all day, but I think that's a perfect place to stop. Well, come home at night and absolutely. we'll talk. <laughs> absolutely. Thank you very much. We've been talking with Marion Seldes for the American Theatre Wing. I'm Ted Chapin. The American Theatre Wing's Guide to Careers in the Theatre is a project of the American Theatre Wing and the New York Public Library's Billy Rose Theatre Collection, Theatre on Film and Tape Archive.